The Beatles rarely worked harder than they did in that summer of 60 years ago. Their schedule was packed full of sold-out one-night stands, recording dates for both the BBC and EMI, yet they still had time for some fun at the seaside. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and it's time to strap yourself in for the whirlwind ride that was July 1963. Although booked from 2.30 to 5.30, the Beatles' latest recording session, during which they recorded their third single, She Loves You, and its B-side, I'll Get You, didn't begin until 5pm and ended up running until 10.45 that evening. Unfortunately, the paperwork from that session, like the session master tape itself, no longer survives. And judging from the near seven hours they took to record two tracks, the session was clearly a difficult one. Now, I'll be going into more depth about the recording of She Loves You and the single itself in a video next month, when we celebrate the 60th anniversary of its release. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that. But at the beginning of July, the music papers and my scrapbooks were dealing with the fallout from John's appearance on the TV show Jukebox Jury, which had been screened on June the 29th. If you remember from our last video, we told how John had ruffled a few feathers with his honest, straightforward review of the records played on the show, especially with his comments about Elvis's single Devil in Disguise. John's negative reaction and general savaging of Elvis's current material had clearly touched a nerve with many pop fans, some of who expressed their feelings in letters to the pop papers, like in this case to the magazine Pop Weekly. In my opinion, the new Liverpool sound is far better than any sound that Elvis makes, wrote David Beck of Derby. Give me the Beatles or Jerry every time. Elvis is too overrated and is also very dated now. The Liverpool sound gives pop music a refreshing future. Down with Elvis, up with the Beatles. In the end, Pop Weekly, which also published Elvis Monthly, concluded that John and the Beatles had gained more fans than they had lost and that things were changing. That same subject was discussed by Disc in this article from July the 6th, which appeared below a great picture of Paul and Billy J. Kramer with his Dakotas in the control room at Abbey Road during the recording of Bad To Me and was titled Elle's Still The King But He's Got To Watch It. The article also reported on a phone interview with John Lennon, who, when asked about his comments on Elvis, replied, quote, But I wasn't knocking Presley. All I did was voice the opinions of so many other Presley followers who think that his discs of late are old hat. John said he thought, quote, I think half the trouble came when he started using the Jordan Airs, and that if some of his old singles were released again, particularly those on the HMV label, he was sure they'd sell like hot cakes. In fact, RCA had reissued Elvis's second album six months earlier, in November 1962, to replace the deleted HMV pressing. The Beatles were back in the recording studio on July the 2nd, but this time it was at the BBC studios in Maida Vale to record their fifth edition of Pop Go The Beatles. Their four-week trial had been a big success, and this was the start of a further 11 programme run of a total of 15 shows. If you'd like to know more about the Beatles at the BBC, do check out our video on that, a link to which is in the description. Another BBC session took place the following day, but this time it was at the Playhouse Theatre in Manchester, where they recorded a session for the light programme's Beat Show to be broadcast at lunchtime the following day. On that show, they performed From Me To You, A Taste Of Honey and Twist and Shout, all in front of a live studio audience. After a further four packed out live shows, the Beatles headed back to the BBC on July the 10th for another Pop Go The Beatles session, after which they rushed onto Margate in the evening for their gig. This cutting from disc from July the 13th announced that the Beatles would be part of a four night mini package tour alongside Mike Berry, Ian Crawford and the Boomerangs, DJ Ted King and Freddie Starr and the Midnighters. That four-night tour would run from September the 4th to the 7th 
and was to be promoted by John Smith, who had been given the go-ahead by Brian Epstein, mainly due to the cancellation of several Mersey Beach showcase dates in the past. Their fee for those shows would be £250 per night, which is approximately £6,350 or around $8,000 today. That same clipping also carried another important announcement, which was the release the following day of the Twist and Shout EP, for which advance orders had already topped 60,000. EPs were huge in the UK in the early 1960s. Costing a third of the price of an LP, their main market was younger record buyers, who couldn't afford the 32 shillings for an album. And with four songs per disc, the EP offered better value than the two-sided single. Also, you got the added bonus of a glossy picture sleeve, which, in this case, features that wonderful shot by Fiona Adams, which you can learn more about in our video on Twist and Shout, a link to which is in the description. It had now been three months since the Beatles' last release, From Me To You, and their fans were desperate for a new record. And such was their appetite for one, sales of the Twist and Shout EP exceeded everybody's expectations even though it contained no new material. Beatles Make Disc History reported this article in Disc. It reported that combined sales for the Please Please Me LP and Twist and Shout EP had now passed 100,000. A spokesman for EMI said that the EP has sold 150,000 in just four days after its release. Not even Cliff and Elvis have beaten this. Twist and Shout wasn't originally scheduled to be the Beatles' first EP. The EP EMI were planning to release was The Beatles' No. 1, which contained the first four tracks from the Please Please Me LP. However, the Beatles' Hits EP, which eventually saw release in September, has a lower catalogue number than Twist and Shout, suggesting that it was first on EMI's schedule for release. But such was the demand for Twist and Shout that EMI had to put it out first. Twist and Shout broke all records for the format and even made it into the regular singles chart, where despite competition from a rival cover version by Brian Paul and the Tremolos, it eventually, on the chart after this, reached number two. Twist and Shout still holds the record for the biggest selling EP in British chart history. The Beatles' number one ended up becoming their third EP, when it eventually hit the shops in November later that year. The Beatles themselves were understandably very happy about the success of the EP, and the money was now beginning to roll in. Paul says in this article, quote, It's the royalty checks that get me. We received one not so long ago for what seemed like a huge lump, and we were told it was only part of our royalties from Love Me Do and Please Please Me. If that wasn't the total sum, I think I'll retire at the end of the year and go and live in the Mersey Tunnel. George chimed in that his sister in Illinois had been phoning the local radio stations to find out why they were playing Del Shannon's From Me To You. And he said, she sold them into playing our disc. And now I believe this has set off a chain reaction all over the States. If we could only get out there, we're potty enough for the Americans to listen to us, insisted John. But there isn't a chance we could go for absolutely ages. Thursday, July the 18th, saw the group back at EMI Studio No. 2 at Abbey Road for an evening session, during which they recorded four songs for inclusion on their next album. The session consisted of 11 takes of You Really Got a Hold On Me, 7 takes of Money, 6 takes of Devil In Her Heart, and 3 takes of Till There Was You. On July the 22nd, after gigs in North Wales and Blackpool, the Beatles hit the seaside town of Western Supermare. Also known simply as Western, Western Supermare is a seaside town in the English county of North Somerset. It was also the birthplace of Capital Canada's president, Paul White. The Beatles spent six days here, and their stay yielded many famous shots taken by the incomparable Deso Hoffman, who stayed with them shooting not just colour and black and white stills, but also colour footage on his 8mm movie camera. Mm -hmm. 
donkey rides have been a tradition on the beach of Weston since 1886, so naturally they became one of the first ports of call on Deso Hoffman's famous beach photo session. The group were then dressed up in Victorian swimsuits, which produced cuttings and posters that adorned every Beatles fan's bedroom wall across the land. Many of the photos taken that week by Deso Hoffman ended up in a picture book called Meet the Beatles, which was published in the first week of August at a price of two shillings and sixpence, which is around £3.20 or $4 today. The magazine shows not just the Beatles in Western Supermare, but also around the streets of Soho, recording at the BBC, and performing at Stowe School. Three years later, it was from this publication that Klaus Foreman took some of the images from to use on the revolver cover. New Record Mirror journalist Jimmy Watson talked about his experiences travelling with Deso as he went to photograph the Beatles, and he, quote, marvelled at their patience with photographers and journalists, who constantly helmed them before, between and after shows. Don't forget, you can read any of these articles in your own time by pausing the video and zooming in on them on your phone or tablet. The Beatles ended the month as they had begun it in EMI's recording studio, starting and completing Please Mr Postman in nine takes, followed by ten takes of It Won't Be Long, but the session time ran out before that could be completed. That afternoon was spent recording Pop Chat at the BBC, followed by a session for Saturday Club, which was to be broadcast on August the 24th. Then at 5pm it was back to EMI, where George Martin overdubbed piano onto Money, after which they did five takes of a remake of Till There Was You, followed by eight takes of Roll Over Beethoven. They then returned to It Won't Be Long, and after finishing that, recorded All My Loving. This brief period, pre She Loves You, was perhaps one of the final times the Beatles were seen to be relaxed and truly enjoying themselves before everything went off the scale. The Beatles couldn't have worked any harder than they did in July 1963. The fact that they had just one day off all that month is a testament to both their stamina and talent, and we're so lucky that they managed to record some of the most timeless music ever made. Next month, we'll look at the events of August 1963, and more closely at She Loves You and how it lit the touch paper for Beatlemania. In the meantime, feel free to catch up with our previous scrapbook episode or any of our other 200 Beatles videos on the channel. I'll be back next week with some more Beatles fun, but I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. <laughs>